How do you feel, uh, Jim? Can I call you Jim? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. You good? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, thank you for this interview and for the time Stop. that you will take answering my questions. I am a climate journalist and I work for the Institut Pierre Simon Laplace that was directed by someone you know uh, well, uh, Robert Votaire. Mm -hmm. My questions will concern three big topics that fall under the umbrella of sciences and uh, society mm -hmm. and the debate between uh, both of them. So we have climate change evolution, your view about what's happening in the world, and the work and the perspective mm -hmm. of IPCC. So in less than 15 minutes, you are going to give a speech about the conclusions from the sixth um, cycle mm. and where we are going with the seventh. So my first question is, where are we going? Well, where, where we are at the moment, I think some of the changes that we've seen to the Earth system over the last year or so, they have been predicted by IPCC in the past, but they've taken place much sooner, I think, I think the, the, than we anticipated. So we really are seeing severe effects in terms of you know, extreme weather events, wildfires, uh, etc. So I, I think we are in a very challenging position with the way, that, the way the climate itself is changing. Mm -hmm. And quite clearly, uh, countries have not put in place sufficiently ambitious policies to allow the kind of objectives, the goals of the Paris Agreement to be met at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like a very depressing picture. We, we're also very keen to provide messages of hope and say that there are things that, you know, that have improved. We can look at, for example, the progress that renewable energy has made over the last decade. The prices have fallen, you mm -hmm. know, the, the deployment ha has increased, battery electric vehicles really coming along. And, you know, 90% of the world's economy is now covered by net zero targets. Yes. Not saying all the policies are in place yet to allow the targets to be met, sure. but 90% of the world's economy has, has, has been recognised. OK, we will see how bad the situation is and also where we are with the solutions yeah. and yeah. With, the, with the messages of hope. So if 1.5 was like a stop on a highway in this long journey that is climate change, wouldn't we be like a few kilometers or meters away? We would be a few meters away and uh, the, the, the clear message is you need to put the handbrake on very quickly if you are going to you know, keep, keep 1.5 in mind. Mm. And even then it may be that the vehicle that you've hypothesized just goes slightly beyond the 1.5 milestone and we need to put the vehicle into reverse to pull it back again. So the possibility of some outreach, uh, you, you, some, some uh, you overshoot is, is, is definitely uh, something that has to be considered. Because that's actually what is happening, like reality sometimes overcomes the, the scenarios. Mm. If you look at the 2023, mm. it was the warmest year since yeah. uh, 174 years. How are scientists and the IPCC dealing with, let's say, the unknown? I know it's the wrong term, uh, but are there, some, are there some tipping points beyond them? Uh, we, we don't really know uh, what will happen and there's no going back. Well, just to say, IPCC doesn't do its own research. You know, it assesses research that other people you have outside. And many of the issues that you've used there are under active consideration by the scientific community and will be covered in you know, IPCC reports that, that come out uh, in the next cycle. And certainly, you, you know, the question of tipping points within the, within the system is something that needs to be considered as a topic in the, in the next cycle. Now, uh, one thing to say, there is no single tipping point. There are lots of tipping points that are specific to particular geographies, different points in time, different warming levels. So it needs a much more granular approach to the question of tipping points. Some may be close, some of them may be past already. Like for example, what would be one of uh, the, the Well, warm water corals is, is, I think, a classic example of something mm. where we've already seen the effects, even at 1.5 degrees warming, you know, we will see substantive loss. Uh, the other thing would be loss of glaciers, that's very close as well. So, so these are examples. Okay. So you inherit a long history, it's the seventh cycle, and uh, we are entering in a crucial phase. Mm -hmm. um, when you were elected, I quote, you told, I will pursue three priorities, yeah. improving inclusiveness and diversity, mm -hmm. 
shielding scientific integrity and policy relevance of IPCC assessment reports and making the effective use of the best available science on climate change. Mm. My actions as the chair of the IPCC will ensure that these ambitions are realized. Mm. How is it going? I think uh, we, we, we are, make, are making progress. I mean, you know, we, we always know that you, you know, when, when scientists run for posts in IPC, they're a little bit like politicians. And we know that politicians campaign in poetry and deliver in prose, if I can put it that way. So there's a lot of hard work concerned with, with actually realising the, you know, these, these objectives. But I think we are making progress. For example, you know, the Bureau of IPCC, the elected scientists, is much more diverse mm -hmm. than it's been in, in previous cycles. 40% of the, of the Bureau are now women, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which is a significant uh, Im improvement on, on the past. And just to say, it's not my, not my, not my job really, but the co-chairs of the individual working groups are, you know, pulling together in a very coordinated kind of way at the moment, which is helping with the interdisciplinarity theme that was one of the things I pressed on. So we have interdisciplinarity, and we have uh, I picked just two maybe new things: um, how science and uh, ancestor or indigenous knowledge yeah. uh, is compatible because I think it's something that uh, s many scientists are pushing forward uh, in different world regions and the second one if artificial intelligence will play any major role. Yeah and, and actually I think the two things need to be linked a bit uh, you know in our thinking. So I have to say you, you know, the importance of indigenous knowledge has been on the participation of indigenous peoples uh, has been uh, you know emphasized by a lot of uh, a lot of the governments participating in IPCC and I think we need to be modest about this because our sister assessment uh, the biodiversity and ecosystem services assessment is it best has actually made more progress on indigenous people than we have so I'm having conversations with David Abura the it best chair and I know other colleagues in the bureau are as well to look for example you know what can we learn learn from other people about how to progress in, in that agenda. On the issue of artificial intelligence, the challenge we have here is that the volume of literature accessible by IPCC doubles every cycle and it is really, really get, get, getting challenging. So we do need to think about what other sort of novel techniques using artificial intelligence, large language models, whether systematic reviews of literature, like in the medical sciences, could play a bigger role in helping us to cut through this huge volume of literature. But so we are hoping to have a meeting which will be called Novel Approaches to Assessment that would actually act as an umbrella for all the things that you've mentioned, indigenous okay. knowledge, but also artificial intelligence and systematic review. Because one of the things we need to look out for is that artificial intelligence and systematic review tend to narrow the amount of, of literature you look at. Indigenous knowledge is about expansion and we need to think that in a coherent way. You once used the formula that the planets aligned between 2015 and let's say the beginning of the pandemics because we had the Paris Agreement, agreement we had the IPCC giving uh, evidence, we had the Greta Thunberg, we had Extinction Rebellion, we also had the European Green Deal on a political yeah. uh, level. Is the golden age of uh, fighting climate change over now? No, or just to say, I, can I compliment you in knowing my speeches better than I do? You've just reminded me <laughs> of things I said some, <laughs> so, some time ago. I, I mean, I mean in my, you, you know, this is the, the third consecutive IPCC cycle I've been involved in. And before I was doing IPCC things, I was doing other things. You always see ebbs and flows of interest in particular political political issues and I would agree the point about 2018 was a particular time when there was a real surge and everything was pointing in the same direction. Okay. It's a bit harder work at the moment but with the kind of very obvious effects of climate change that we're all seeing I think this will this will come come back again. I mean there are ebbs and flows it's to be expected. Because just to ask you again about this the geopolitical situation is not let's say the best one now, it's a little bit deteriorating. Uh, as a scientist who speaks a lot with different governments, is it uh, a big matter and how do you deal with, with that? 
Yeah, and just to say, obviously, your country and my country is right in the middle of elections, right at right at right at this moment. So I can't comment on you know individual countries, but yeah, I mean, I talk to lots lots of different governments about the climate issue, and I think they are all concerned about the climate issue, but they will emphasise different parts of the challenge. So, for example, in some parts of the of the world, there will be a big emphasis on emissions reduction on the mitigation agenda. In other more vulnerable parts of the world, people will want to talk more about adaptation. Okay. And then there are other sets of governments who want to put climate action in the wider context of sustainable development and think about the means of implementation, particularly financial flows and financial aid. So I think they're all interested but they all want to hang their coats on slightly different hooks, if you see what I mean. I, I, I think I understand. Do you receive a lot of pressure? I, I know that you won't really answer that question, but I'm going to rephrase it. How do you deal with the pressure that you receive and how can you hold together um, the precaution of the form of the language on one side and on the other side, the fact that you have to deliver a, a powerful message to the community? that yeah. expects something from... The, this from depends. I, I have to say most, most of the lobbying tends to come from scientists rather than from governments on, <laughs> you know, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you're talking about, about the approval sessions you know, where we, we, you, we discuss with governments what the precise wording will be, then uh, you know, it, it's a case of you, it is genuinely a consensus between government and scientists. And that's where the power of an IPCC report lies. Because when, when it's then taken up, adopted within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, nobody can go back on what was agreed because all governments were part of the consensus. So sure, it's a, it's a tough discussion, but it results in a very positive outcome. And certainly when I've been chairing approval sessions of IPCC, which I've done several times now, the thing is, you know, when a sentence comes up, you always turn to the authors and say, is this compatible with the underlying science? And I don't think we've ever come up with anything that's tr incompatible. Mm -hmm. As you told before, France uh, and also the UK is entering in a new political phase. Uh, generally, what changes when uh, the IPCC deals with governments that are more willing to change and governments that maybe are more reluctant to take actions? Well, this is actually not for us. That's for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That, that is where these, these discussions take, take place. place. Okay. You know, we have to put the evidence in front of them. It's their choice. It's the politician's choice how to act on it. Mm -hmm. But what can scientific institutions, I think, for example, at uh, l'Institut Pierre Simon Laplace, but also somewhere else in the, anywhere else in the world, do in order to share the knowledge to the decision makers and also to society. Yeah, I think it's, it's important. I mean, very obviously, because of these carefully negotiated texts, sometimes they are not the most beautiful or comprehensible language that comes out of it. So it is important that they are interpreted, you know, for other audiences. Personally, I think the best way of doing that is if third parties can take what IPCC has done. For example? Uh, uh, for in the last cycle, there were a series of reports called Summaries for Urban Policymakers, which third parties took the IPCC reports and interpreted them for the audience of decision makers and practitioners operating in cities and, and human settlements. And I think that was something quite successful. And the, the key thing there is IPCC authors and bureau members can advise these third parties on what they're producing, but it's also a chance for IPCC to stand back a little and say, it was your words, not my words, because sometimes there are difficulties when you interpret text, put it in more simple language. Some countries may come along and say, this is not the carefully negotiated language that we agreed with you. Mm. So, which is why, in, from my point of view, it's preferable to get third parties to take the responsibility for that. Okay. IPCC is not the all doesn't answer every challenge. We're part sure. of an ecosystem, and we yes. need to operate with other people. And in this ecosystem, it is easier to solve disagreements with scientists or with politicians. Uh, no, no. So scientists and politicians are both difficult <laughs> sets of people. I mean, obviously, IPCC is scientifically very, very diverse. 
you know, so we have a lot of physical scientists in working group one, we have many more social scientists and economists in working groups two and three, and there are differences in the cultures of these different scientific communities, and even uh, differences within social sciences communities that sometimes need to be negotiated as well. So, I mean, that, that's the job of an IPCC chair, perpetually, uh, you know, trying to bring different communities together. But I, I think despite the limits that IPCC could have, there is nothing more efficient on a worldwide uh, level than, uh, than the IPCC to tackle climate change. Do you measure, measure, I think, every day this responsibility and how do you deal with the feeling sometimes of maybe shortcoming? Oh, I, I, well, I have been involved in IPCC so, so long, honestly. If I were to worry all the time about what we are not doing, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. I do get out of bed in the morning because there are so many, many things that need to be done, uh, both in terms of real climate action, but also how you keep a very complex organisation like IPCC running effectively as well. OK, I come to my last two questions. Uh, the first one is um, there are some regions in, in France, but also elsewhere in Europe, that were once industrial powerhouses and yeah. now they struggle a bit with the ecological mm. transition. Mm. You come from Dundee, it's a, a place in Scotland that has this industrial past. How, why, in your opinion, it is hard to change in these places where, let's say, all started? Yeah, it, 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 well, this is, this is very, very city specific because my hometown actually had its big challenge during the 1970s when the textiles and the shipbuilding industries went down and it didn't get so much of the business about oil uh, and gas for example even though it was on the east coast of Scotland that went to another city we compete with further up the the coast in in, in Aberdeen but I mean one thing when the last time I was back in Dundee uh, you used to see old oil rigs there in the river being refurbished before they were sent out again now it's full of ships with monopoles for offshore wind turbines and these incredibly sophisticated ships that have monopoles and stacks of blades that go out and assemble off offshore wind things. And just remember there are, there are also jobs in the new economy as well as the old one and it's incredibly important to look for this economic diversification and look at the new opportunities that will come from lower zero carbon economies because they are absolutely there. You told that, uh, you mentioned the word cities, there is a special report about cities coming, uh, coming uh, yeah. in the next few years. Why it is important to focus on cities? Because so, uh, such a large proportion of the world's population will be living in cities during the 21st century. There are also very effective sites for integrating different concerns. You know, you've got different systems for energy, water, waste. You can, and it is often easier for cities to make coordinating decisions across these, perhaps easier than it is for national governments. So there is a lot of really agency and power at the city level, as well as simply the fact that lots of people will be living in them. I have one last question. What is the question that journalists never ask you? Uh, that's for you to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I will think about it. And is there something that they always ask you? Uh, the, 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 well, you, you pretty well proceeded during, during this interview. Are scientists surprised by you know, the speed with which climate change is happening? That, 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 that's a classic question. And I will always be drawn into the political area and try to elegantly push, it, push back on it a little. Do you have a last message for, for us? Well, well, for, for, for people, people in u universities, the, the, this is a really, really important topic. You know, it's going to be around for decades to come. It's, go it's going to drive people. And frankly, it calls on all disciplines and all skills to deal with it. It's not just for physical scientists. It's for social scientists, economists, other people as well. Thank you very much, Jim, for the interview. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>